Wow, Julie, thank you. That is absolutely the most lovely introduction I've ever received. I wish my mother were here to see that. Uh, wow, much, much appreciated. And I feel like I ought to just say at the top, looking at this wonderful picture here of the amazing NATO summit that you all hosted, not only a Thank you from President Obama and the entire delegation uh, who descended upon Cardiff uh, and Newport uh, for those critical days, but the weeks leading up to that. But just a huge thank you, Stroke, I'm sorry for the disruption that I know we caused uh, to traffic flows, to the normal course of business uh, here in Cardiff and in Newport. So just a huge thank you because the generosity and the hospitality that you um, showed for everyone who visited, especially for my country, was hugely helpful and it is deeply appreciated. So thank you. Um, I don't really want to give a lecture today um, because there's so many wonderful people sitting around here whose ideas I'm eager to learn from. So uh, I just want to throw open to the group some of the things I'm struggling with and thinking about as it relates to US-UK relations and as it relates to US-Wales opportunities that we have, and then get your suggestions and comments. Does that sound good? OK, great. And Julie, you mentioned um, that time, the second time we met, because the first time I went to University of South Wales, met with them. Second time I met with that group of uh, young Atlanticists you mentioned. Now, I had learned a little bit of Welsh tiny bits of Welsh in preparation for this trip. I was so excited to try it out. And my friend at the embassy who worked with me on this, I'm, I'm going out the door to catch the train to go have this meeting with Julie and that group of about 100 young people. And, uh, and he said, oh, by the way, this is my friend, British friend from London. He's like, by the way, no one will actually speak Welsh in that meeting you're in. I was like, well, not no one. He's like, no, no, no I mean, practically no one. And I don't know why I thought I was very confident. I was like, do you want to bet? He said, sure. I said, he said, of the 100, how many do you think will speak Welsh? I said, I don't know, 40? So it's not a good bet to make. <laughs> he said, no, four. And I was like, that is crazy. So I go, I show up, and as you remember, I said, quick show of hands, how many people here speak Welsh? Zero. <laughs> So that was too bad because I had, I was, you know, itching to um, show off my bad Welsh. <laughs> so then I um, went in advance of the Prime Minister and President Obama visiting this elementary school uh, right outside of, uh, not too far from Celtic Manor. And we go and uh, my job is to make the kids uh, sort of entertain them until these two big guys <laughs> arrive. <laughs> so then I think, aha, here's my, here's my chance. So I was like, how many of you young people speak Welsh? <laughs> Zero. And the wonderful woman who's running the school was like, I can take you to a Welsh class with five-year-olds who are learning Welsh. So I was like, sure. I mean, I'm desperate at this point. <laughs> so I go, uh, so I go to, the, to, to this group of five-year-olds, and my only thing I can say in Welsh is a joke, which I will say in English. Um, and so I start into it, and it's my little set piece, and then I realize halfway through it that no one in this group of five-year-olds is going to find it remotely funny. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the joke that I told <coughs> in Welsh and then in English. They didn't laugh either time. In Welsh, I said, my fellow Americans only know three words of Welsh, Catherine Zeta Jones, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> and they sat there just stone-faced. Um, so then I was like, well, that didn't work. And so I look at these adorable faces of these young future leaders of, of Wales and the UK, and I say, OK, um, that didn't work. I said, um, you know, any questions? No, not really. And then I said, OK, what's your favorite number? I have little kids, so I figured, OK, favorite number. And so one guy says 23, and another person says 156. And then there's this young girl, like right in front of me. She's like eagerly waving her hand. And I was like, yes, you know, what's your favorite number? And she looks up and she says, I forgot. <laughs> I 
was like, that's so great. Could have made one up, I wouldn't have known. But uh, anyway, so later today I'm going to try out a tiny bit more Welsh. I won't inflict it on all of you uh, yet. But more seriously, um, so I was proud of this Welsh. I was able to say it later on to a group of people who, who seemed to care, or at least played along. Then I get back to London, proud of my um, small Welsh accomplishments, uh, and then I undercut all of whatever good work I did in Wales was undercut by one undiplomatic. In an unguarded moment, I revealed to a journalist that I had been in my first year there, um, had grown sick and tired of lamb and potatoes. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a terrible, uh, it wasn't quite what I meant or really said, but it got out there and it really stuck. So ever since, I have been on the eating lamb and humble pie circuit. <laughs> I have no idea what, we're, what is in store for us today. I actually do like lamb. So I had offended the national dish, uh, so all my Welsh was for naught. But anyway, part of, this, of these travels um, on the humble pie circuit brought me out of London, like today. But the other day, I was going up to Hull. Anyone here been to Hull? Anyone here from Hull? OK, great. So I get on the train in London first thing in the morning uh, up to Hull, and I pull out my iPhone, and I am trying to go I'm on Wikipedia trying to find famous people from Hull. I mean, I knew Wilberforce because I was going up to the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, you're probably all thinking in your head, the famous people from Hull. You have probably five on the tip of your tongue. I did not have any other than Wilberforce. So I'm flipping through, and I'm trying to get to M for music because I figure that's a good way to, to go. Uh, but on the way to music, I hit mathematics, and it turns out there's a famous British mathematician from Hull whose name is John Venn, V-E-N-N. -N. And he is the guy who invented the Venn diagram. I mean, who knew? I thought this was so lovely. <laughs> and my first thought was, I probably owe this guy royalties. <laughs> Because in my internet days, there were whiteboards everywhere, and I was forever drawing two overlapping circles to describe whatever it was I was working on. Um, but the second thought I had was, gosh, think about the Venn diagram of the US and the UK, and think about what I had just done to discover John Venn. I hopped on a train, invented over here, adopted quickly in the United States. I got out my iPhone, a great American product, designed by a Brit, Sir Johnny Ive, from Newcastle. Um, and I get on the internet, developed in America, but rapidly adopted over here. I get onto the World Wide Web, invented by a Brit, commercialized in America. And I get onto Wikipedia, invented by an American who lives in London. So I thought that's pretty cool. Look at the US-UK overlap. And by the way, I quickly said the internet developed in America, adopted over here. But any computer scientists in the room? Donald Davis is an amazing computer science Welsh guy who actually was the first guy to do packet switch networks. For those of you who are geeky and know about how the internet protocol actually works, the two men who did ARPANET, which was the precursor to the internet credit, Donald Davis for coming up with this innovation, which led them to invent the internet. So there's US Wales. But we could spend the rest of our time celebrating, and already our two wonderful opening remarks touched on the amazing US Wales overlap. I don't want to do that with our time. I want to close with a thought and open it up for discussion around two different overlapping circles, which is government and business, regardless of which side of the Atlantic. And I'd like to ask for a quick show of hands. How many people here either currently work or have worked in government in one form or another? OK. How many people have worked or currently work in business? OK. How many people here have worked in both? OK. So it's a pretty good picture that as a Venn diagram. And what I think about, you could, by the way, look at that same trip to Hull in light of what government and business do together, right? Railroads were something companies did to move coal around. And then someone in public policy maybe could move people around, right? So you saw that flow. The internet, which we love and we celebrate, completely driven by government, government-funded 
in the United States. I don't think they know where it would lead to, the wonderful things it's created. But starting from the government, going into academia, and then uh, into the private sector in unimaginable and powerful ways. Um, I think we have an opportunity before us in the next few months, certainly in the year ahead, where there's another fruitful overlap between government and business, and it's as it relates to the big transatlantic trade and investment deal, which is very uncleverly and unmemorably called TTIP. Which, anyone here following TTIP closely? Yeah, I thought so. I mean, this is a very sort of unremarkable, unlovable name for a very important deal between the European Union and the United States on trade and investment. I hope you'll be hearing about it in the coming months. Um, Prime Minister Cameron is advocating for it. My boss, President Obama, is advocating for it as a great way to not only sustain but to grow jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, there are many people out there who don't like it, and they are being very clever uh, about poking holes in this. And so I hope in the coming months, uh, as you learn more about it, um, you will um, share and speak up for, uh, if you're in government or in business, all the good things that TTIP and trade and investment uh, could do for both our countries. Um, so that's the fruitful overlap. But I think we also need to be aware of two other things happening in government and business. I want to ask you to do a quick thing. We haven't eaten lunch. So I'm going to ask you, close your eyes really quickly. I want you to think of the first word that pops into your mind when I say government. OK, who can share with us what? Bureaucracy, red tape. Whitehall. Whitehall. Regulation. Regulation. Taxes. Taxes. Spendthrift. Spendthrift. <laughs> Politics. Politics. In the good sense? Support. 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 Enabling. Defense. Defense. There we go. OK, that's a good sampling. OK, part two. Close your eyes again, please. First word that pops into your mind when I say business. Bank. Was that bank or okay, bank? Innovation. Innovation. Overregulated. Overregulated. Loans. Opportunity. Loans. Loans. Essential. Essential. Profit. Money. Money. Undervalued. Undervalued. Here we go. Now we're getting into it. <laughs> Um, OK, thank you for playing that little game. Um, as one of you who would have raised my hand along with having worked in government and in business, um, I think we need to, and look, those caricatures, and we know what business people say about government people when there aren't government people in the room, don't we? <laughs> and government types know what it's like when we're all in the room together and business people aren't around and what we say about them. And look, the caricatures of the two um, circles, if we stick with Venn for a moment, are real. Like all characters, there's an element of truth to them. Uh, they're not the whole truth. Uh, and they have their place to sort of poke fun at one another. Um, but let's be aware that when we're in those rooms without the other one around, that we don't let these two circles come apart and lose that fruitful overlap that brought us railroads, that brought us the internet, they're going to bring us innovations in life sciences and lots of other things we do happen at that overlap. So that's one concern, that they drift too far apart. But the other concern is that these two circles get too close together. Because the power of the Venn diagram is the overlap, not them becoming one circle. And I think if government and business get too close, that's creepy. And it was a previous US president, I don't know if he had any Welsh roots, certainly had German ones, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who famously at the end of his two terms serving as president, remember he knew business well, he knew government well, military well, he warned us, Americans, and I think the world, of the military industrial complex, right? So we need government to be government and business to be business. Celebrate the fruitful overlap, but keep them distinct. We don't need to just run governments like business or business like governments, and I think sometimes we get sloppy in that language, and we emphasize the overlap too much. We each have a role to play. So with that as a 
oversimplified. If you could picture, if this were a whiteboard, you picture the circle of government, the circle of business, the overlap, or the circle of Wales and the circle of the United States, and that overlap. With that as a sort of overlay, I would love to open it up for suggestions, comments, concerns. Thank you. <laughs>